ourselves for worship. Let's sing this out. I'm coming with a heart of worship. I'm bringing in a brand new song. I'm ready to see the unthinkable. I'm ready for a miracle. Hearts praying for a fresh encounter. Souls looking to the
Welcome to VNC. Want to just take a moment and thank you for joining us in worship this morning. Also want to thank all of you online that we are able to gather together in this place and in this space. My name is Eric Wood. I'm one of the pastors here. And just want to make sure you know that you are welcome here at VNC. Maybe you've walked in for the very first time. Maybe you've been checking us out over the past couple of weeks. But we want to be able to connect with you. If you would do us a huge favor, there's a, there's a QR code going to be on the screen. If you take your phone out, just scan that code. That gives us a little bit more information about you. We get to start a journey with you here at VNC and help you take those next steps in your spiritual journey. So if you would just do that for us. And then right after the service, if you would stop by, there's a place called Guest Central right in the foyer. Pastor Sean, our lead pastor, is going to be out there. He would love to meet you, and he has a small gift and just a way of saying thank you for worshiping with us today at VNC. We're excited about what's happening today. First service was incredible, and we're going to be in a couple moments singing a couple more songs. We're going to spend some time in prayer. Pastor Sean's going to bring a message here in a little bit, but we are also looking forward to next Sunday. Next Sunday is our baptismal services in both the 9 and the 1045 service. That is a chance for us as a congregation to come alongside people who are publicly proclaiming their faith in Jesus that we get to celebrate with them on that day. So we encourage you to come back next Sunday to join us for that and to come ready to celebrate because it is going to be an incredible time just to hear the stories and the testimonies of what God is doing amongst the people here here at VNC. There's a lot of things happening in the life of the church, and we encourage you to jump on our website. Go on the website. There's an app that we have as well. You can download that, and you can just explore all of the different opportunities to connect in groups and classes and the events that are coming up. There's a lot of things happening that we don't want to just bore you by, by talking about them right here in this space. So go on the, on the website and check those out. One last thing before we continue on. On any given Sunday, we, we strongly encourage, we love the fact that children join us in the room for the service. We, wanna, we want this to be multi-generational. And when we see kids worshiping alongside their parents, that is, we believe there's value in that. And so it is usually the norm that, it, that children are welcome and encouraged to attend in the service. However... I do want to let you know that Pastor Sean has kind of put a PG-13 rating on the service. Some of the content that we are going to be talking about is a little bit more mature in nature. And as he would tell you, if, if you want to have some awkward conversations on the way home, that may be the case. We encourage you that if you want to, in a moment, we're going to, we're going to have some greeting time and a couple more songs. If you want to slip out and take your, your kids and check them in to our children's ministry, I want to just take a moment and brag on them. Our children's ministry is not not a place just to entertain our kids while the adults get to do church. Our children's staff is intentional 
and purposeful on helping our kids to believe, to belong, and become fully devoted followers of Christ. And they do an incredible job of, of engaging our students and helping them along in their spiritual journey. So if you want to, in these next couple moments, you want to slide out and take your kids and, and check them in, we do want to make sure you know that the content this morning is a little bit more mature than it normally is. And that is definitely the exception and not the norm here at VNC. So let's go ahead, and if you would, let's stand up, find someone near you, greet them, welcome them to VNC, and uh, we'll continue on in worship. Those of you joining online, thank you again for worshiping with us. If you would, jump in the chat, say hi to Pastor Aaron, say hi to all the people that are there, and make sure that you make yourself known in that place. As we continue in worship this morning, we're gonna sing about our story. Our story is God's people, chosen and dearly loved. And we're proclaiming and declaring that we will not forget, we will always sing about his goodness and his faithfulness, his pursuit of us and the love that he has poured out to us for thousands of generations. Let's proclaim this together. Sing, I won't forget. I won't forget the wonder of how you brought deliverance, the exodus in my heart. Cause you found me, you freed me, held back the waters for my release. Oh,
We're going to spend these next couple moments in prayer together as a church. And the song we just sang uh, two songs ago talked about the God who fights for me. I don't know what battle you've brought in this morning, what battle you're facing each and every day, those of you joining online, what that looks like in your life. But I invite you, in these next couple moments, what better way to fight that battle? Maybe you wanna come kneel at an altar. Maybe you wanna write that down and put it on one of our prayer walls for other people to be praying for that throughout the week. But I invite you to, to live in that truth this morning as we go to prayers. We go to the God who fights on our behalf, who has our best interest in mind. So I invite you, if it's to an altar, maybe it's just standing at your, in your seat, maybe it's down at the prayer wall, but whatever posture, whatever helps you come before that God, our God in such a way that trusts in that, in that fight for, on your behalf. Father, we thank you and we love you. And we are humbled that you have given us the opportunity that we can gather together as your people that we can come in this place, that we can be shoulder to shoulder with other people who are crying out to you, who are singing out your praises, who want to glorify you, that want to see you magnified in their lives. That in this place, it's, it's, it's almost easy to be able to be like-minded, to be able to rest in the fact that we have people on our side. And we pray that it's in the midst of, of this setting and, and, and in the midst of people that have our best interest in mind that we are strengthened in our faith, that we are able to go from this place, that when we leave here today and we go back into our worlds, into the places that you have gifted us with, the places that you have entrusted us with, that we would be your ambassadors, that we would be strengthened by your strength, but also knowing that we've got people who have our back that we can count on the church, that we know that they are praying for us, that they are thinking about us, that they are there to encourage us, to grieve with us, to mourn with us, to celebrate with us as well. So right now, we pray for those that are crying out to you. And some are able to do that publicly. Some are able to do that as an expression that people are able to see that and know that. And there are others right now that are fighting those battles internally. That it's deep down inside. It's one of those that we almost wish, that we hope that no one will ever find out that battle that's going on. Whatever it is, we know that you are, you are for us, that you are with us, that you are fighting on our behalf, that you have gifted us your Holy Spirit to come in and to work in us, to move in us, to make us more like you. Father, we're so thankful that you've given us this gift of a place that we can, we can gather together, that you've given us technology, that people are able to join online and worship, that we are all singing and worshiping in one voice, one truth, one spirit. We pray that as we continue on in the service, that you would continue to be magnified, that as you have already gone before us, we don't need to invite you in this place, you're already here. We just need to open our eyes. We need to open our ears. We need to break down the barriers of our hearts to say, do something crazy awesome in us today. Something that we couldn't even describe if we tried to because only you are able to do that. I pray for Pastor Sean as he speaks today, as he brings your word, as he brings your message, that it's not his words, that every word that comes out of his mouth is anointed by your spirit, ready to be heard by your people. Father, I pray for those that have come down that are praying at altars, that are praying over our requests, that are, that are hurting this morning, that you would comfort them, remind them that you are there, remind them that you are real, remind them that you are fighting for them today. We love you and we thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Amen. One of our great traditions at VNC, we love this time of prayer. We, we believe that everything that we do in, in the morning of this 9 o'clock to 10, 10, 15, that time frame is all worship. 
We want to do everything that is worshipful to God. So the songs that we sing and the time we spend in prayer and the message, we also believe that one of those acts of worship is the giving of our tithes and offerings. And we are thankful for a church that week in and week out just continually shows what generosity looks like. And we invite you that if you came prepared to give today or maybe you're thinking about that and you've got some questions, we'd love to talk to you about that. But there are some boxes on the walls. As you leave, you're able to participate in that. And there's places online that you can give as well. But we're just thankful. Thankful for church, this church that has shown us so much generosity that we are able then to take those resources and bless our children and our youth and our community and do so many things in and for uh, the Valparaiso area. So thank you for that. But now I do ask that you prepare your hearts as we are in week three of our series called Guardrails. You know, so as Pastor Eric has already mentioned, and hopefully you saw on social media and stuff, this is kind of a PG-13 message today, so just be aware. If you want to take advantage of our incredible children's ministry, now would be the time. If not, probably ought to gear up for an awkward conversation on the ride home. Doesn't bother me. Either way, just want to make you aware. And so as this, the whole kind of theme of this series has been about not necessarily making the right decision or the wrong decision, but what is the wisest decision? What is the most God-honoring decision I can make in my life? So what is, the, what is the wisest thing I can do? When it comes to the choices that we face in our life, the choices that we have, what is the most God-honoring, what is the wisest thing we can do? And this uh, series is really kind of put together. There's guardrails, there's, uh, articles have been written, Andy Stanley, m- m- many others have put information together. But the guardrail kind of comes from uh, the actual instrument that we see on, in the roadways. It was designed to keep vehicles safe, to direct and protect us, to keep us from going off the curve and down the ravine, crossing the median, or off of a bridge, all those things. They may cause, uh, the guardrails may cause damage, minimal damage to your vehicle, maybe even to on your person, but it beats uh, then what di- uh, dying or, or the life that could be taken because of these car accidents. And guardrails were designed for us to keep us safe. You know, our greatest regrets when we look back in our life have been avoided, could have been avoided if we had established guardrails early on. If we think about them financially, morally, relationally, professionally, we all have stories in our lives we wish we could go back and we could have thought, you know, if I could go back in time, did you get in that time machine and go back to where my greatest regret was The choices I made that were unwise, if I could go back there and put up a guardrail, my life probably would have been different. The life of children, grandchildren, down the line, maybe could have been avoided. And so many times we begin to think that guardrails are actually a sign of weakness, but they are a sign of wisdom. Not weakness, but wisdom. And we connect people, when we start thinking about our greatest regrets, maybe We even connect them to people in our lives. And a lot of times we called them friends. People that we dropped our guard, shared information with, let them know who we are, what we are, those things. Now, I may sound judgmental, but it's actually just exercising good judgment. So today, as we kind of move in, we are talking about something even more dangerous. And dangerous environments call for extreme measures. Morally dangerous environments call for guardrails. These, these are the tough things in our lives that the, the stakes are a little higher. You may be thinking, man, what, what's, what's higher than, than what we've talked about the last few weeks? And if you, by chance, have not been here with us, you can get on our website or our app and you can listen to the, the previous couple weeks and kind of get caught up. And, and I gave you kind of the flyby just now, but as we are looking forward to this morning... We live, and we've talked about this a little bit, but we live in a sexually charged culture. And because of that, it makes moral guardrails mandatory. And for those of you that are following Jesus and you are all in and you desire to honor God and honor those that they love, we, we will be tempted to take our cues from culture because it's so prevalent. And our culture really does a really good job of baiting us and luring us in morally and relationally to disaster 
And when disaster happens, we are mocked, made fun of, maybe even left alone. And our culture does not encourage guardrails. In fact, our culture really wants to just live with painted lines. And it's so today, as we look at this, we look at this, here's what I'm going to talk to us about and what we feel like we need to cover is guardrails in our marriages, guardrails maybe until you're married, or guardrails from married people, but also just guardrails including your sexuality. Now, 1 Corinthians 6.12, Paul writes this, I, I have the right to do anything. But not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. I have the right to do anything. And there is some reality that we all live with that you have. We are free will beings, free will beings. You get to make choice. Becoming a follower of Jesus does not remove your ability to choose. So you can choose to do things. However, not everything you would choose to do could be good for you or even beneficial. And so today we're going to talk about those guardrails that keep us. We're not talking about eliminating you for your free will or your choice. We're talking about putting guardrails up so we make the most beneficial, the wisest, the most God-fearing decision and choice we can make. So today as we move into this, it's, it's, it's an area that I think is kind of resisted. And we talk about fidelity. And it's a Latin word, it's fidelis, so it just means faithful or loyal. And nowhere does our culture, like I said, do a better job of baiting us and then shaming us. And part of it is we're kind of complicit. We're, we're, we kinda, we're kind of to blame a little. Because we're, we're entertained by our media, our, our music, our movies, what we read. Because they all kind of lead us into this sexual ex explicitly that leads us in this area and and then it's it's just kind of entertainment it's just entertainment it's just a song it's just a movie it's just whatever and then we become disgusted when an affair takes place in our neighborhood we we we're not disgusted on our favorite tv show when the star finally falls in love with the other person that's not, they're not married to because it's entertainment. We see it and we're like, yes, finally. I've been waiting on them to hook up. I've been waiting on them to get together. It's entertainment. But when it's in our neighborhood, when it's in our life group, when it's in our family, now we're disgusted. We hate it. We're angry about it. It's hard to talk about. Now we gotta explain things to children. Now we gotta talk about who gets who at Christmas. Now we gotta talk about how are we going to handle graduation. How, now we, we got all kinds of new conversations. When it was just a, a movie or a show or in a song, it was entertainment. But when the rubber hits the road and it's in our neighborhood, it's in our life group, it's in our church, it's, it's in our family, it's in our workplace, now everything kind of changes. And it makes us angry. It hurts. We're confused. We don't know how to handle this. And I, and I hear phrases. I hear phrases, you know, the boys with their toys and, you know, boys will be boys. It, it's, it's like we give men a, a get-out-of-jail-free card to be stupid. Well, that's garbage. That's garbage. There's no get-out-of-jail-free card to wander. There's no get-out-of-jail-free card because that's not the life, that's not god honoring, and that is not the wisest thing to do. I wonder what would happen in the church if we really got mad about that. I wonder what would happen in the church if we really got fired up about the fact that we wanted to hold marriages and families to a higher standard and to say fight for it, to fight for it because it's so damaging. 
And here's what I think. I think if we did, if, if the church really got fired up about it, we would have less poverty. We would have less unwanted pregnancies. We'd have fewer men in prison, less domestic violence, fewer kids in foster care, fewer kids raised without a mom or a dad. And we all know someone or maybe we are someone who was raised by someone whose life would have been better if they had had relational guardrails from the beginning. If they had just pumped the brakes in their life. And Paul writes, and we're gonna, be, we're gonna spend most of our time this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter six, the first four verses there. I mean, not the first four, but 18 to 20 there. We're gonna look through that, but the 18, the first part of verse 18 says this. Flee from sexual immorality. Now, that's just one sentence. Flee from sexual immorality. I, I, I mean, and that's just really, that's what all of us desire. It's what every husband, wife, engaged person, parent wants. We want to flee from sexual immorality. I, I mean, here's what I'm wondering is, are we spending too much time flirting with sexual immorality? It, 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 it's kind of exciting, it's exhilarating when somebody the opposite sex, uh, sex that is not our spouse shows us a little bit of attention. And, and it, it, it's kind of exciting. And, and now with technology, we can hide it, we can do all these things. So we flirt in the danger zone because it's, it, it releases chemicals in our brain and, and all of a sudden all kinds of adrenaline gets pumping and we're excited and it feels good it, it, or, or maybe it's finally somebody showed me a little bit of attention and so the next thing you know, wow, we start flirting instead of fleeing and Paul is pretty clear here, flee, flee from it. I, I mean, if, if you've ever been to, I know we're heading into wedding season, it's May, June, you know, everybody's, it's, the rush is on, we're heading into it, but can you imagine the vows at a wedding ceremony or a, your wedding ceremony if when the man and wife are doing the vows or repeating them back to the minister and he says, do you solemnly swear to do your, you, to, to remain faithful and the guy went, you know, I, frankly, I'm just gonna do my best. But boys will be boys. And if, if Mary down the hall in my office happens to become available, I got no promises up here. You know what I'm saying? Well, nobody would get married under that pretense, right? No, none of us. I mean, if, you're, if that was your daughter after you hit the guy with the chair, you're like, get out. You're not doing this. I, there's no way. There's no way. But we have a commitment that we all desire, we want, we desire, we agree to. It is that I solemnly swear I am making an oath and a covenant. I'm making a commitment. I'm making a promise. And so he continues. The, the next part of verse 18 says, flee from sexual immorality. That's part A. The rest is, all other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. So now it's getting deep. It's uniquely damaging. I mean, it's fully possible. When, when we have sin in our lives, we can recover financially, we can recover professionally, we can recover from these things. We are apt to forgive and move on if somebody lies in the business deal. In fact, we may even continue to be in partnership with them. Because we're like, ah, he may have fudged the numbers a little, but what he meant, and sometimes that's just business. But when it comes to this sin, it is unique because it affects others. You can be forgiven. I'm not saying you can't. You can be forgiven. But can we fully escape the damage? No. Maybe it's even generational because it undermines future intimacy. It, it, it damages others. I, I mean, when, when things resurface, when, when sexual immorality resurfaces in our life, 
And this is what we found out about sexual sin. See, if you're in a life group or you're in a setting where you're sharing about your story, you may be okay to say, hey, listen, I was 22. I made a terrible mistake. I got a DUI. I, I, I regret it. I, I, it's better now. Or, or, you know, I, I filed for bankruptcy. I, I messed up. I, I bought into this scheme and it failed. I messed up. We, we're okay. I mean, that's something everybody's like, yeah, I get, I, I get it. But we tend not to share because sexual sin makes us a liar and a secret keeper because we got to protect. We have to, we, have to mis- we have to move it around. See, sexual sins in the New Testament was talking about when sin hurt, still or dishonor another person. When we, when we had this effect, and, and, and at first you may think, well, where's God in that? Well, when we hurt, steal, or, or, or defame a human, then we are really, it's against God because we are his creation. He, he chooses us. He made us. He celebrates us. He wants us. He loves us. He needs us. He, he, all those things. And so we are his, we are, we, we are his, and when we are wounded, hurt, the sexual sin is, then, then it's a problem with God. We have now put an issue between us and God. We're one of a kind. I mean, who else? No, no other thing on earth did God send his son as a living sacrifice in our place. He didn't do that for the zoo animals. He didn't do that for the ocean life. He didn't do that for creation. He didn't do it for the ozone. He did it for you. He did it for me. So therefore, your value, my value, extremely high. In fact, there's nothing more valuable. So that's why this is so serious. That's why Paul is going, you got to flee from this. You got to flee from this because all other sins a person commits, all other the sins that a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually, you're sinning against your own body. Therefore, you're hurting God. It's against Him. And, and so when we, um, when we take what was designed, when we take what was designed, to be an exclusive, one-of-a-kind covenant relationship between a man and a woman, to be married, and we take it and we divvy it up amongst other people, when we begin to divvy it up amongst several relationships or partners, when we, then we, we're taking what was supposed to be beautiful and we cheapen it. We're hurting ourselves and we hurt them. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Our own body, we hurt ourselves. And, and we, we betray it. And then Paul continues. And he says this, this phrase, is, do you not know? And, and we're, we're going to kind of play with that for a minute. But do you not know? That may, and it's almost like maybe you haven't heard. And maybe when we were talking about this, you were in a tent. Maybe, maybe you were at work. You were fishing. Whatever it was, maybe you don't know. So he gives you a little bit of grace. He's like, maybe you don't know. But let me just tell you. See, there's a grander reason for believers. It's in verse 19. He says, do you not know that your bodies, your bodies, ours, are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? So the whole thing here begins to shift from consequences to the identity. Do you not know what you are do you not know who you are see now it's hard for us because our country is so young we don't really have a lot of sacred temples around we don't have a lot of places that are just you know that are just sacred to us it's kind of meaningless but what paul is talking about is you and i are 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 temples of the holy spirit that when Jesus said, I'm sending you the comforter, when, when you ask to be a follower, when you receive Christ in your heart, when you are, I want to be a follower, I am all in, then the Holy Spirit begins to indwell in you. We talk about it, our spirit begins to work in cooperation with the Holy Spirit. Some of us put up more fights than others, but we begin to hear that still small voice, 
the knock at the door, nothing loud, but it's the whisper. But it's because the Holy Spirit is indwelling in us that we become sacred image bearers, that we were fine-tuned and made to live in relationship with God and with others. Now, now one of the things just, just, again, this one's just free. You do with it what you will. But in the Old Testament, when Moses, when they, would, when they would establish camp, a community, the first thing they did was they built a temple or a tabernacle. And it was probably tents or, or it could have been made of stone. But that was where God dwelled. He didn't dwell in the other tents. He didn't dwell in the outskirts. He dwelled in the temple. So that's why they had to go to the temple, tie a rope around the priest's ankle in case he has had any sin in his life, and he would go into the Holy of Holies to represent you and I. And if something happened, he hit the ground, they drug his body out, and they got the next priest and sent him in. Well, after Christ's new covenant, we no longer live under the old covenant. Under the new covenant, he's saying, I'm sending the Holy Spirit to indwell in you. So now, not only do we not have to go to the tabernacle, that means the Heavenly Father is dwelling with us. So wherever we go, that's the church. Wherever you go, wherever you go, when we gather to worship, when you go to work, Friday night, wherever you go, the Holy Spirit is going with you. It's not like you can say, hey, you may want to set this one out. I'm going to go to some places you probably don't want to go. I'm going to be with some people you probably don't prefer, you maybe never even met. So you may want to sit this one out. That doesn't, we, we can't do that. See, the value of a container is determined by what it contains. And, and, and maybe you came in today and you were starting to think, I, you know, when you hear the phrase, you are not my own, you might be thinking, I'm an adult, I'm a senior citizen. I, I am my own person. I'm a free agent. It's my body. I get to choose. I, and Paul says, no. No, I'm, and I'm glad you're, you're not because ownership determines value as well. So you were bought with a price. You were a temple. You were a temple of the Holy Spirit. So the value of a thing is determined by what it will bring and, and, what, and what does it cost? I mean, so if, if we went to the store today, a baseball that would be used in Little League or the Major Leagues or all the same size, those baseballs cost probably around 10 bucks. $10. $10. But there was a baseball that was hit by Aaron Judge. He plays for the New York Yankees last summer. His 62nd home run. That baseball was auctioned off for $1.5 million. It's not the baseball, right? $10. I feel like we should have bought a bunch of them baseballs and just signed Aaron Judge's name on them. It's because of the value of who Aaron Judge is is what brought value to that baseball. And that's what happens to you and I. See, therefore, in light of the consequence of sexual sin and your extraordinary value and our potential for intimacy, he continues in verse 20. He says this, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Now, this is New Testament like this sexual ethic. Honor God with your body. And fleeing requires guardrails. It has to become a top priority. It has to become a top priority. And, and here's, this is, this is just me talking to you. Friends, do with it what you will. If you're with us online, just friends talking. There are individuals in your life you know that are a problem. There are people you may work with. There are people that are on your, on your child's travel team. They, there is a flirtatiousness about them. There is a, there's something that when they come in the room, you take notice. And for whatever reason, they want your attention. 
whatever that may be, you know the problems. And this is what I tell people when they come in to see me. I do not believe that an affair, when someone steps out on their spouse or someone they're dating or engaged to, when somebody steps out on them, it was never just, it just happened. It just happened. An affair happens in our minds and permission is given for it to become physical. Now that's just my thoughts. I just cannot get in my hand that it just happened. Because there comes a moment in time where there is a connection is made, words are exchanged, and a desire to leave the situation, and at that moment in time, you had to already give permission. You had to give permission mentally, you had to get there in your heart, and the decision was made. So whatever or whoever is in your life that you know nothing's happened, no texts have been sent, no messenger, no message has been sent off a social media app, none of that has taken place yet, then whatever, whoever, stop. Stop. You know. You know who the person could be. Avoid it. Get rid of it. Your son's future Major League Baseball contract will survive changing their nine-year-old team. Your job, I don't care how much money you make, is not worth destroying your family. Quit. Ask to be transferred. Figure it out. But it's not worth it. It's not worth it. And social media has made it very easy to do things in the cover of night that may be even hard to track. But whatever that temptation is for you, whatever issue it is, whatever it is, there is nothing more important than fleeing and not flirting. This is unbelievably dangerous. And if you're kind of questioning, like, I don't know, Quitting my job seems awfully extreme. When you are in extreme, dangerous situations, it calls for extreme measures. It calls for you to do things that you normally don't do because you're fighting for your family. You're fighting for your children. You're fighting for your grandchildren. You're fighting for your church. You're fighting for your witness of being a follower of Jesus. You are fighting for your credibility and your integrity. So you have to do whatever it takes. You have to do whatever it takes. So when you find yourself hesitating because you're like, ah, then yes. My old football coach used to say, if you have to think about it, it's wrong. If you feel like an interaction you've had with somebody from the opposite sex was inappropriate and you think you should keep it as a secret, that's your conscience saying, run. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with your spouse. Be honest with those that you're dating. Be honest with somebody. Become clean. And for the love of all good and right, If somebody from the opposite sex is having a problem in their marriage and they want to talk to you about it, unless you are a paid, trained counselor, don't do it. Don't do it. They need help and you're not it. You're setting both of yourselves up for danger. So when you feel your heart desire drifting towards a specific person, tell someone. Pull your friend together, come come clean, just say, sometimes when we just say it out loud, that's enough to shock us back into like, what what was I thinking? What was I thinking? It often diffuses what's happening. And this applies if you are single and, and there's no, you know, your thing, but it applies to married people's guidelines. Just stay safe. Stay safe. 
Now, this may just seem totally old-fashioned. It may seem like, where, what planet are you living on? But Paul says the days are evil. And there's no other place on the planet that will equip or that our culture equips to support you to remain faithful. Who else is fighting for your fidelity? Who else is fighting? Who else is fighting for your family? Who else is fighting for you to remain whole and intact with the Holy Spirit? Who else is encouraging, equipping you to live responsibly sexually to say, this is not who we are and we are going to flee from this? Who's setting you up for future success in this area? I mean, do you, I mean, I, I, I can't imagine. I've never had anybody do it, so maybe, maybe you may know someone, but they've looked back and said, you know, 10 years ago, I set, up these sexual, I set up these guardrails to keep me sexually pure. I am so disappointed I did. I, I, I set up these guardrails, these, these, these things in my marriage that, that we just made a commitment that, you know, I'm not going to break them. You know, I, I will tell you, one, one of the things Ashley and I have, um, you know, as from a youth pastor to pastoring now and been pastoring over 30 years, that, that if, if, if somebody from the opposite sex, and, and, and actually anybody, that if, if she has, if her wife, whatever that is y'all have that goes off, hair stands up, tingling, spidey senses, whatever that is, if there is somebody that is wanting to meet with me and they're just adamant it has to be me and Ashley's spidey senses go off, my answer is no. It's an agreement I made with her in 1992. And frankly, I would rather hurt your feelings than make her mad. I got to live with her. Eh? I, your, your feelings are your feelings. Deal with it. But I, geez, I live with her. But in 1992, we made an agreement. If somebody, if some, it, there's something, spidey senses go off, she says, you, you should not do that. I don't ask, well, why? What are you thinking? Are you sure they're having a hard day? I'm sorry. I can't meet with you. I can meet with you, but I need X, Y, and Z to happen. So and so is going to be in the room with us. Well, I, 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 what I have to tell you is just for you. I'm sorry. That's not going to happen today. Whatever you have to do, because you're the one that was set up for a one of a kind relationship, romantic marriage. I mean, holy cow, God created sex. I mean, I, I don't know how that conversation happened in heaven. I don't know. I, you know. I don't know if there was a conversation and the angels are like, God, well, uh, what are you doing? You wouldn't get it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But it was intended. It was intended for this intimacy and to be shared in the confines of marriage and nowhere else. And great romance in a marriage is fueled by a sense of exclusivity that you are alone and together in this. So flee. Flee. It requires guardrails. Whatever it is, whatever is popping up in your life, whatever it is that you want to stay in the safety zone. So guardrails aren't weak. They're for the wise. You know, in John 10, 10, Jesus said that the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And I have come that they may have life and have it to be, have it to the full. We need you to fight. We need you to fight. Get angry about it. Protect it. Cherish it. Cherish it. Fight for it. Because I believe one of the ways that Satan works is we already know he's a thief. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He's just destroy the family, destroy the marriage, you destroy the home. And if all those three things happen, then it destroys the church. 
Fight for it. Fight for it. Put up a guardrail. If you have to move, if you have to quit a job, if you have to transfer, if you do whatever you have to do, fight for it. It is the wisest thing that we can do to remain faithful to the covenant that you either have made or going to make. You have to fight for it. I'm going to invite you to stand with me. A couple of our musicians are going to come out and play, and we, we're not going to go long. We just got a few minutes. But maybe today you have a loved one with you, you have a child with you, you, you have a spouse with you, or maybe you are here all alone. And I believe, I believe that there may be a whisper in your heart today that said, I'm so glad this doesn't apply to me. I am so glad, and if, I, I'm so glad it doesn't. But maybe you're also sitting there and you're going, hey, I would love to get some help. I'd love to, I'd love to pray about this. I'd love, I'd love to someone to let me know they've been there. They know how hard it is. I know, I'm with you. I believe Satan will whisper in your ear and tell you, don't move. It's way too embarrassing. You don't need that kind of attention. I wanna encourage you today. Stepping forward may be the toughest decision you've ever had to make. However, it also may be the very catalyst to bringing peace and health into your relationship or future relationships. It may be the very thing that you need to do to say, that's my new guardrail. It's up to protect me, to save me, to keep me whole. And so as they play, I wanna pray for you, but you gotta fight for it. You gotta fight for it. It's not easy. It's a decision you have to make. So as I pray, maybe today, as they play softly, you're just saying, you know what? I'm going to fight. And the best way I know to fight is to pray. So I'll invite you now. If you're online, please jump in the chat. Talk to Pastor Aaron and his team. If you're in this room, I'm going to encourage you. I'll encourage you as I pray to kind of move and to pray. I got friends that would love to pray with you and for you today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Father, we thank you for the time we have to, just be in time, to spend time in your presence. Father, I pray wholeheartedly that we have the courage and the strength to fight for our marriages, to fight for our families, to put up whatever guardrail we have to put up. To change whatever we have to change. Father, I pray right now that you give our people wisdom beyond even what we can comprehend or even have asked for. I pray for wisdom that we do the next right God-honoring thing in our life. And Father, today, as we go our separate ways, that we live a life that's honoring to you. And we ask these things, your most precious and holy name. And everybody said, Amen. if today you feel like, you know what, I just can't move, please, Give us a call, text us, email us, holler at us. Put the guardrails up. Fight and fight. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. We look forward to worshiping with you again next weekend as we celebrate baptism. We have a number of individuals sharing about the life change that has happened to them uh, in their lives. 
and we can't wait to worship with you. Thank you so much for being with us today.